Ready. There he is. Hi. Hi. Right. Um, whenever you're ready, Connor, it's all Fantastic. over to you. I'll disappear. Great. Thank you so much. I was wondering where my paper would actually fit in with this lineup. Um, and I'm kind of glad to listen in the past two that it does work really, really well. So um, I feel a lot more confident now that that's happened. So thank you for those presentations. Um, and I'll just begin. So I'm doing my paper on Wrong Turn, the 2003 version, not the 2021 version. Um, and I'll just begin. So in Finn Ballard's paper, No Trespassing, the post-millennial road horror movie, um, he says that the subgenre of road horror um, therefore fulfills something of the role previously held by folklore. Both are strongly moralistic media, which warn of the consequences of trespassing, and both delineate the rural environment and its inhabitants as bloodthirsty, dangerous, and to be avoided at all costs. And it was the last part of this quote that struck me as the most odd, um, that kind of gave me the root of this paper, and it's where he said the rural environment and its inhabitants are bloodthirsty. And I stopped for a minute when I saw that, um, and I wondered why he prescribed an environment as bloodthirsty, and why he dictated this agency upon it that denoted undertones of aggression to outsiders and of a predisposition towards certain groups over others. And then I realised that what Ballard did there is what Disney did with Grandmother Willow and what Tolkien did with the Ents against Isengard. And he diametrically opposed it against this concept of urban deviant encroaching on the sanctity of the forest, a desecration of naturalistic virtue through either intent or sheer bad luck. And it was these thoughts pouring over one another like treacle down stone that set in motion the thought process that would come to anchor this paper. And it's because it's easy enough to look at Wrong Turn, again 2003, through a lens of early noughties slasher and consumerist bent cap um, cannibalism. It's reductive, but it's easy to do. So instead, this paper that I'm giving just now, it supposes it's more fruitful to look at it wrong turn and the environment it uses, in this case the Appalachian Forest, and how it refounds the rural as an evocative statement of neutrality in a society that remains wary of it. So I asked myself, first of all, before I looked at anything to do with wrong turn, I asked myself, is America scared of the woods? And then I thought it could be argued American fears of the wilderness are anchored in their colonial heritage. America formed from clusters of colonies on the East Coast to a thin strip of land that we all know now as the 13 colonies before it started its westward expansion. America, you could say, found a deep resentment of the wilderness and the native peoples that inhabited that wilderness and a virile desire to tame it. And I think someone said in the comments about um, American folklore seeming more as if it's trying to dominate um, more than its British and European counterparts, and I totally agree. The Americans expanded westwards, and as they did that, they enshrined these ideas of nobility and chivalry and its cowboys, its frontier pioneers, and all those who dared to venture outwards into the forests in the name of American glory. For them, the wilderness was not something to be explored, but to be conquered not to be trusted, but demystified. And this has had real world trends. Um, I think it's really important to note that um, although he was writing in 2008 um, in Scientific American, David Belio, sorry, I can't pronounce it, noted that uh, there is a decrease in American visits to national parks, a decline rate of roughly 1% a year since 1991. And while pressures on younger children in schools, rising costs of visits and technology are all in some way blamed for this decline, Belio includes a strange quote from Richard Love, the chairman of the Santa Fe New Mexican based Children and Nature Network. And in that quote, Love says, you didn't have the concept of stranger danger in the past. If you are raising a generation under protective house arrest, will they have a joyful experience in nature, end quote. So why, I wondered, would Bailey include a quote like that? 
Stranger Danger isn't exclusive to rural, nature-rich centres of excursion. Stranger Danger, as proven, is more likely to happen within two blocks, two streets of your house, rather than on a family trip to a national park. And Bilio continued citing Patricia Zaradak, Zaradak of the Environmental Leadership Programme and her colleague Oliver Pergrams of the University of Illinois and how they plan to, quote, tackle the issue of fear, end quote. If fear is a factor, what kinds of fear? Fear of the unknown, fear of animals, fear of getting lost, fear of crime, fear of disease. And again, as I was reading this in preparation for this paper, I was shocked. Here was the answer, and it links back to what I discussed earlier around those initial fears of the colonists. The wilderness becomes the bogeyman, a catch-all for natural fears around urban life, especially one in a new continent, as in those early colonists. Far from being scared of venturing out into the woods, it seems, Americans may be scared of the woods reclaiming what is naturally theirs. And so horror in the woods isn't exclusive to wrong turn. And this was one of the big difficulties I had in navigating this paper, is that because wrong turn isn't part of an official horror canon, like um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre I'm about to discuss, it becomes difficult to prescribe these academic engagements with it without first rooting it in its context and history and where it directly came from. Horror has exploited this tension between urban and rural, who owns which, and claims of sovereignty over the land since its gothic roots. In modern cinema, as I just said, it was Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1974 that arguably blew this specific notion of urban dwellers infringing upon rural autonomy onto the big screen. Now, just before we move forward with that, I know Deliverance came out in 1972 and that did do an awful lot of what I've just said the Texas Chainsaw Massacre did, but Deliverance isn't explicitly a horror film, so we're just going to breeze past Deliverance, all right? Well, travel fears had, of course, always been shown on film. Marion Crane and Hitchcock's Psycho springs to mind. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre was where the natural, really, what the natural world really fought back, inhabiting the mute implied simple personification of its rage, the infamous Leatherface, and countless others have copied, paid homage to, ripped off, and emulated this trope. Wade Newhouse, in his article, The Origins of Crystal Lake, Captivity, Murder, and an All-American Fear of the Wood on the Horror Homeroom, posits that places like Camp Crystal Lake are ersatz frontiers, and allow for the tensions of teenagehood's liminal space in its own right to become a frontier on the edge of adulthood, creating this kind of cyclical argument in what I'm saying back to the early colonists. But of course, I'm here to talk about wrong turn. So that's our main event. So just a little bit of background into it. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole film. I'm just going to talk about the part that is the hinge point of this paper, the turning point of what I believe is where nature becomes this kind of neutral aspect that I said in my introduction. And it's when we find our protagonists, Jesse and Chris, they're played by Eliza Dushku and Desmond Harrington, being hunted from three mutant hillbilly cannibal monsters, Three Finger, Sawtooth and One Eye, through the Appalachian wilderness. How and why this situation arises is easy to guess. Um, and while they flee deeper and deeper into the woods, they took a wrong turn, essentially, and that's how they ended up here. While fleeing deeper and deeper into the woods, they stumble across a watchtower and desperately seek its shelter. Within the confines of this bastion of civilization, proof that the world exists out with the West Virginian barks, they try fruitlessly to make contact with forest rangers in the hopes of escape. And this was in 2003, when mobile phones were less readily available and the current cliche of, but I've got no signal, how can this be? Um, 30 seconds of every horror film that we need to endure since um, didn't apply back then. Their hope is futile, of course, of getting in touch with those park rangers. Instead, the mutant hillbilly cannibal monsters, unable to assault the tower directly, choose to do what any hunter would do and smoke them out. And so, as I said, this is the key scene in the film and the reason for this paper. 
because Jesse and Chris at this point can no longer do what any survival guide worth of salt tells you to do, and that's stay still. If you get lost in the woods, stay still so that the search area is as small as it can be, and they don't have that option. So instead of burning alive, they jump. They literally jump from their tidal pool-esque haven, surrounded and, and surrender themselves to the woods. The trees are tall and thick and strong and provide a temporary relief to our protagonists. As they make their way along the interconnected branches, arrows assail them from the ground, but to no avail. The forest shows itself in this scene for what it is, a neutral landscape that horror often, and Ballard above, miscategorises as hostile. Then of course there is the infamous tree scene and I call it because it, it's this film's big mistake, huge moment a la Pretty Woman. Three Fingers is pursuing them along the branches, he scaled a tree himself. So we get this classic horror setup of our protagonist running away from the killer. And were this a regular horror film, there would we would see more of this running and then a great big staged fall and a quick death but this is wrong turn as jesse and chris run along the branches they fundamentally shake something that bernice m murphy quotes in her chapter the cabin in the woods order versus chaos in the new world as a principal trope of the american horror film which so often pivots on the relationship between a naive white person and territory which they perceive to be wilderness. Jesse and Chris set a trap. In the turning point of the film, Three Finger finds himself a victim of the forest he lived in his entire life. As he rounds a tree trunk in pursuit of the seemingly vulnerable Jesse, our blonde damsel in distress that horror likes to play with, a tensed up branch by Chris thwacks around the tree and sends poor old Three Finger to the forest floor. Our protagonists now have time to escape. While the film doesn't end here, the fallacy of the naive person, excuse me, being victim to the wilderness as an almost second, the wilderness becoming almost a secondary hunter is quashed. Here again, I return to Murphy. We find one of the strengths of the urbanite being exploited. Murphy quotes on one of the great tensions and horror as being due to the conflict between settled community and mobile outsider. But here we see that this mobility, this ability to adapt and evolve, being solidified as a strength rather than a weakness in a rural setting. This fundamentally undermines the relationship between protagonist and environment and antagonist and environment within the film. It might be plain, it might be being played away on, on away turf, but that doesn't mean the urbanites are down and out. And so I just want to end with what this means for academia when we're watching these types of films. So the film ends in a typical Hollywood style with again, another Texas Chainsaw Massacre homage, homage sorry. except instead of the final girl as the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, being in the flatbed of the passing truck. She, Jesse and Chris are implied to be lovers at this point, are the ones driving the truck. But where does this leave us? So as a viewer, subject to a slew of exceedingly more difficult to watch sequels and a reboot that imbibes scant of the original. However, as academics, we find ourselves challenged by what we've seen. We must engage critically with the way narrative and its ramifications for how we perceive horror. Since Scream, arguably, many horror films have been actively begging us to look at what we're watching, to define what we're seeing as we see it, while placing it within a larger context. Hopefully you found this paper as having achieved that. And while I hope I've helped bring to light as a greater attention to detail at how space, environment and place are accepting of our preconceptions and or how they subvert them as everyone's paper is doing. For after all, if our two typical all American protagonists in wrong turn aren't scared of the big bad wolf, the big bad woods, ugh, then why is horror cinema?
and that's me that's my time thank you